Well, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Yay. We're going to talk about a bunch of things, but mainly we're going to talk about me because that's what I'm about. And this is, if you've ever heard me speak before, you'll know that I always say it's a big head trip for me because that's kind of what it is. I mean, like when you're young, you think to yourself, oh my gosh, one day I'm going to be that guy that comes through and like spouts his wisdom out. And well, I'm that guy. Here I am. And so <laughs> you kind of have to listen to what I say. And if I just BS all the way through it, well, you won't know. And you have to listen to me and be polite anyway. So I'm that guy. So it's a big ego trip if you think about it. And so I, I'm kind of aware of that and kind of, uh, you know, hey, come on in. Um, so I'm really excited to be here and kind of happy to be here. <laughs> Just uh, we're all kind of sitting on the floor at this point. Um, so welcome. Glad to see you guys. So thanks for taking your time out of your evening and thanks for your thanks for your presence. And I hope I get to talk about a couple of things and uh, th that are interesting to you. And let's get going. So again, if you've ever heard me speak, I kind of go through this spiel, you know, who I am and what I do. Um, my name is Jay Chris Griffin. My fans call me, my friends, not fans, call me Chris, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Um, and uh, I, I, it's like, you know, Gordon G. Newman. I just put my first initial first. It stands for John. And, you know, the family guy, if you've not noticed, is named Chris Griffin. And it kind of just distinguishes me in a Google search from the family guy. And, it, you know, my wife is no longer confused on who I am. Am I the dork from the family guy or am I me? So um, that's kind of what's going on. Uh, I'm a record producer and a vocal coach and, and some other things, um, but uh, my big credits are like uh, John Legend, Kanye West, Kelly Clarkson. I've worked with Janet Jackson. I've worked with, um, gosh, jazz guitarist John McLaughlin on, on Industrial Zen. I've, I was that 18-year-old guy on stage with The Temptations and The Four Tops and Martha Rees and The Mandela's. Uh, I play in saxophone. I toured out of Nashville for a little bit. Uh, I wasn't, well, I was that good, but not that good. And so when it came time, you know, there's a fork in the road that everybody kind of finds where you're at the end of your talent. And the question is, do I want to put the work in required for like the next step? And the answer to that was no. Um, and I was pretty far along, you know, I was kind of opening shows for Crosby, Stills and Nash, and I was kind of doing my thing. And I was like the next saxophone player, so to speak, I could have done it. But production just interested me so much more. And uh, at that time, synthesizers and you know, working with different people and being in the studios just really interested me. So I put the time into this path, and well, it worked, and here I am. Uh, we've been in New York for almost 12 years, and we were in Nashville before that, me and my wife. So here's my studio, just a little bit. You know, it's just kind of a nice, small production room with uh, you know, some nice gear. It's downstairs in one of the big complexes called the engine room. And so the engine room has a large SSL live room, and it's big, and a lot of famous people come through. So I feel kind of privileged to be there. Here's some of my gear. Here's some more of my gear. Yay me. Um, and I, I kind of have gotten a geek side to me. I've always been into building stuff, so I started building my own gear. So I'm, like, super geeked. And my wife is just kind of laughing at me through this whole thing, going, you are, I married a geek. I can't believe this. And I'm like, yeah, believe it, girl. And here's another wire to hold. <laughs> so, so I'm kind of into, you know, building my stuff. And it's, so it's kind of an interesting, I don't know, dichotomy of life. You know, I'm this artist on one side, as crazy as crazy can be. And then I'm very logical, kind of as logic as logic can be, because, you know, tracing signal paths has to be very logical. So it's kind of this interesting juxtaposition of worlds, but that's the world we live in in today's modern music industry. So am I an artist or am I a technician or am I an engineer? I don't know. I'm just me. And so I think that gives me maybe some insight on how to do a vocal. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, a few years ago, uh, well, two years ago, in fact, this is my partner, Hannah Sumner. She's here with us. Uh, she convinced me to kind of codify all these things that I was doing, producing vocals. You know, Sony would send people down to me, Warner Brothers would send people down to me, and it would be like my job to get the vocals right for the record. And, well, every singer kind of needs the same help, you know, regardless of their level. So I just started kind of remembering some of these things. And I had good training myself. Uh, I've got a music degree. I trained under some really, really good people. Um, and so I started kind of writing all these things down, and we together formed the Pop Vocal Academy earlier last year. April of last year, 
and started just kind of making this a thing, and it's worked. And we've put people on The Voice, we've put people on Broadway, we've had people win the Apollo, uh, we've had put people on Glee. Um, I think that's the big ones. Uh, and then countless people learning how to sing. There are a lot of, who's a Pop Vocal Academy student here today? So some of these guys are here, and it's a pretty fun place to be. We're trying to have a, a good time. Um, so with a crowd this big, and with so much stuff going on, it's hard to kind of say, all right, here are the 800 things you do to get a great pop vocal in the studio. So I don't know what I'm going to talk about. I mean, I've prepared a lot of things. And so if you will, we put up a tweet that Hannah's going to monitor right here uh, at Pop Vocal Academy. So if you'll tweet us, what do we hope? to talk about, that would be really cool. And if I'm not talking, she already kind of knows what I'm going to talk about. And she can just kind of whisper to me, make sure you talk about this. we got a lot of people wanting this. So if you'll kind of just tweet as we go, and I'll put it up here again through the different slides. Just tweet at Pop Vocal Academy, hey, I wish you would talk about this. or this. And we'll you know spout out questions too. But I may be in the middle of something, and you think of something that's not quite related. Go ahead and, I mean, I don't know if that works. We'll see how it works as we go. But yay. OK. Um, so we're going to talk about the perfect vocal recording. Let's first define what the perfect vocal recording is. Who's got an idea? Shout it out. Yeah. A good signal to noise ratio, mm -hmm. a proper room, yeah. a proper microphone, and a proper performance. Not bad. Not bad at all. All right. Anybody got anything to add to that? Because that's a really good explanation. Sure. OK, so now we got no such thing as a perfect vocal. That's actually valid, too. Very well said. What else? Somewhere in between. Lauren, what you got? She's like, don't call me out. I came. <laughs> All right, so here, here are like four or five little things that I think consist or make a perfect vocal good. They are, number one, like he was saying, a very clean signal path. It's crystal clear. When you put on your headphones and when you listen to a perfect vocal take, in my opinion, it just sounds like you're eating money, which is a good thing. It, you can just hear the quality going into it at every phase. It sounds open on the top end. It sounds like you're in a beautiful space. It matches the track. It's just gorgeous. There's no distortion of any kind. There's no like false compression of any kind. It's beautiful. The second thing I like is there is excitement, there's adventure, there's passion and pain, all in appropriate measure for the song we've got. The singer is actually like feeling it and living it, or for lack of a better series of, of, of terms, uh, they're really working this vocal and you can feel the excitement. It's like a roller coaster ride when you put on your headphones, you're like, ah, oh, and you're crying with them, or you're moving with them in some other way. Um, it sounds fun. It was fun to record. It sounds special. It was special to record, both for the vocalist and for the engineer and for the producer. It sounds easy. It was easy to deal with in the studio. It was easy to hear. It just sounds all of these things. Uh, anything else, now that I've kind of given you a, a series of guidelines, anybody got anything else to add? All right, so now that we've kind of got a perfect vocal loosely defined, is, is, Lauren, you got your <laughs> okay, I'm embarrassing her. She's the only one I know back there, and she's kind of like, eh, huh? Okay. Oh, I see. Sorry. All right. So what we've got is kind of this equal blend of mechanics and art, right? So the first thing you said was it's got a good signal path. But a singer in the booth, do you know what a signal path is? Right? Singers, and only singers, um, th that are not like technical people, raise your hand, would you? All right, so do you know what a signal path is? Like off the top, yeah, you're like, what is signal path? I don't know. And uh, you know, most artists, me not included, don't really care like all of these terms. They're like, let's just C3PO, R2D2. Like I learned a long time ago that my wife was like, I don't care. Let me blow dry my hair, and if I like it, I'll tell you. What is that weird sound? Take that out, and you'll be fine. And I'm like, what? You ca can't even hear that. Yes, I know. Uh, this is the way she listens to music, and this is the way most people listen to music. And they're just riding along, and they're like, what is that weird sound? I don't know what, you mean the melody? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we had this weird blend of mechanics and art. So 
how many of you in here are like engineer types? Are you very technical? You're producers. You're not quite seeing us. Let me get a show of hands. All right, there's more than that. I'm kind of looking at you guys going, you're not, you're not a singer. <laughs> All right, singers, raise your hand. Let me, get a, let me get a number. Okay, quite a few then. All right, producer, engineer, technical types, raise your hand. Okay, so we got about half and half. That's really good. Okay, so I'm going to try to talk to both camps because there is kind of, well, there is a, there's this no man's land between the languages that nobody really likes to address. That's what this is about. You're in the right place. We're going to address kind of that no man's land so that the two of you groups can start talking together. I think that's why I'm here. So everybody's kind of nodding their head. Yes. OK, so let's start with mechanics, because we're kind of in the mechanics first realm. And art, in my opinion, has to have some setup. You don't just like wake up out of your bed, roll out, and, and like start creating art. You have to have some preparation. If you're a painter, your paints have to be purchased. If you're an illustrator, you kind of have to have your pencils and your ink ready. You have to have your paper ready. You have to have your computer ready. So there's some mechanics that have to begin. So let's talk about those first. Who knows about microphone placement? What, what does anybody know about microphone placement? Well, you have to really know what you're recording so you can place the microphone. And also, you have to know the environment you're in. Well, we're in a vocal, in this case, uh, we're in a vocal environment. Yeah. We got a vocalist. Yeah, but the first thing I would like to know is with the pattern for that microphone. I think that's the AT4050. Yeah. Yeah, so that's cardio, right? All right, let's assume it's in cardio mode. Yeah. All right, and let's assume that it works and that for it's those happy. For uh, know what cardioid is for the singers that raise their hand, it's what the microphone is actually going to capture, which, you know, part of you singing it is. Will it be straightforward or will it also capture on the side? Will it capture from any direction and so on? Mm -hmm. So let's say that it's cardioid, that's like a heart shape. So I would probably place the singer about a foot away from the microphone mm -hmm. and I would see how they sound with both with the pop filter and without or do the closest cause <laughs> trouble. Also at the same time I would make sure that you know the sound source is not reflecting so we don't get let's say we place it on the wall and the, that microphone captures the wall and then captures the reflections and cause phasing issues. Okay. I would try to keep it as clean as possible between the sound source and the microphone, the pattern the, itself. Good. All right, so you know quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> what is your name, by the way? Boyan. Boyan, that's a good name. Where are you from? I was born in Serbia. Ooh. It's a country in Southeast Europe. Yeah. yeah. Very, very cool. Well, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thanks. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this off, and what I'm going to try to do is illuminate some of that, which was very well done. All right, give me just a second. This is one of those things where I wish I would started with it off. See, see, you RSVP'd. They didn't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So how many of you, all right, so, yeah. <laughs> Microphones have about a quarter size capsule. You can actually see this one really, really good. They have about a quarter size capsule right there, right? And you can kind of see it, like if I reflect it in, 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 most of you guys that have taken a microphone class know all this, right? But what you may or may not know is that this thing is really sensitive straight in front of it. But it's not at all really sensitive here, or here, or here, or here. It's sensitive, but it doesn't have that sparkle. Every mic has a sweet spot that it's designed to have. Some of them are just off center, some of them are right on center, some of them, like he said, are a foot away. So what we do to kind of dispel a lot of these things when you sing into a microphone, think of a live microphone. How big is this capsule? Well, again, it's about a quarter size. Think of a live microphone. Now, when you're in a live situation, where do you put the mic? Somebody tell me. Do you put it here? Where? where? Right in front of your mouth? Now, why right in front of the mouth? Do I put it here? How about here? So when I'm talking, hey, what, won't it pick me up? It would, but it would pick up a different timbre of Ooh, your voice. Ooh, 
interesting. All right, say that again. It would pick up a different timbre of your voice depending on where the mic is placed or where you hold it. All right, who's got something to add to that? Because that's exactly right. Well, I, mic, you can, you, there's some mics that literally could, well, that could pick you up the farther you go. I, oh, I guess that's fine. How about this mic here? What if you're speaking like this? I can't hear you. What do you do? Or some people go like this. Hey, right here. But they don't go like this, do they? Right. Like right into that microphone. How about if you're talking like this? Nobody can really hear you. Why? Because the microphone's pointing. Now, isn't this an omnidirectional mic? It, isn't this a microphone that's supposed to pick up everything equally, right? Yeah. Yeah. But how many of you been like, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, right, I was talking to my dog. Right, how many of you have done this? Yeah. Okay, so I understand what you're saying, but the answer is no. You would lose, exactly, you would lose the high end. Now, you would not believe how sensitive that high-end little area is. It's not even the size of a pencil point. It's really, really, really small. So you would not, on a live mic, it just makes sense. You don't want to sing right here. And if, you know, if you're, hello, hello, right? That's going to come over. Right? We're going to be like, yeah, I remember when he did that. So um, I thought it was funny. It was way funnier in my mind as I was coming out with that. So. <laughs> So we know, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go home. And it's never, like you get, like, all right, when you were little and you started watching the Grammys, they would, they would put the mic way down here because that's what the Osc Oscars did in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And all the Grammy nominees would be like, I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> right? And you'd be like, dude, dude, it's going to pick you up. And they didn't trust it, right? Remember that? And now they just bring it up to them. I noticed that on these last Grammys. Yeah. OK, 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 OK. Right? And now, but it, now they've cut off all the speeches so they aren't what they used to be. And then they play that doggone, like, evil music. Like, get off now. Get off now. Okay. So you have this kind of thing um, right here. So all of you guys now know that this capsule is the same size capsule as on a line mic. So you, it, it needs to be right here, right there. But here's how we sing most of the time. We have lyrics, may I borrow this? And here's how we sing. All right. All right, I'm ready. Hey, what's up? <laughs> right? Or, um, no, I don't quite know the words. Or, right? And so we end up kind of getting this odd timbre, and it is literally like singing like this. So how many of you have dealt with that, both as a singer and as a producer? Nearly everyone, right? How fun is that to mix? Oh, it's terrible. Give me, while I'm screwing this up, give me, shout out some indication of what's so terrible about it. It's just, uh, I don't know, it doesn't sound clear. It's not clear at all. So we're violating one of the things about the perfect vocal right away. What is it? The, the dynamics are off. Just oh, the way yeah. They, like, turn their head and they're like, oh, I can sing this part now. They, like, start. Singing. Right. <laughs> yeah, they get a little more comfortable. Singers, what about you guys? Why wouldn't you get on the front of the mic? You, anybody want to confess? Okay. Well, Say it again. Somebody might be scared. I was like, oh, I don't want to hear it. Yeah. And also, from the singer's point of view, when they get into the zone, they really and they close their eyes. They really don't know where it's the center of that diaphragm. Uh huh. Yeah. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay. So let me show you guys, everybody, where the microphone should go. In my opinion, of having done this for 20 years, there are more than one. There's more than one way to do this. So this is just what I'm throwing to you, and you can disagree or not, and it, you know, we can discuss if you'd like. Um, but we think about this quarter size capsule, and we just get right in there with our lips. Dum, dum, da. A, A. And I would say between six to seven inches, and well, depending on what we want to do, we'll talk about distance in just a minute. But start out about six to seven inches. Can you see how this should be right at my mouth? Can everybody see that? Yeah. Is that fairly clear? Okay, and then, so you, and then when you have your headphones on, you want to just kind of easily peek around about an inch circle and try to find that sweet spot. And you'll hear it immediately be like, oh, on some microphones it's right in the center. On some microphones that have been kind of worn a little bit, it's, it's a, maybe, the, maybe it's an inch off. Maybe to the side or up at an angle. You'll find it. Every microphone is different. They're like a drum head. Some have been spit on more than others and they kind of warp a little bit. And if they warp too much, they don't work obviously, but you got to kind of find it. And every singer 
Every mature singer who goes into to the studio with a new mic immediately goes, hello, 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 hello. And what they're doing is they're trying to find that sweet spot. So encourage your singers to do that. And you'll find a clarity like you have never known in your life. I remember when I was a young engineer, and, the, and back in those days, you didn't mix the things you tracked. You sent it to mix engineers, and they would come in at the 6 o'clock shift in Nashville. It was a 10 to 6 town. And so you would do the tracking in the morning at, at 10. 2 o'clock, Carters would come. Everybody would leave. The, the lead vocal would come in at 4 o'clock, 4.30. The backgrounds would come in. At 6 o'clock, that mix engineer was there waiting on you, and you had better be done with those four <laughs> songs. Yikes. But that was the way it was. And so they would, and sometimes as I was breaking down, I would kind of stick around and be like, Griffin, man, you just, you didn't nail the vocal today. And I'd be like, dang, you know. Oh. And I remember the day that I really, I mean, I just really got almost anal about where I was putting this mic on this guy. And I told him, you better sit still. They're going to yell at me. They're not going to yell at you. And he's like, I'm paying my money. And I'm like, you shut up. And, so <laughs> <laughs> and they finally, finally, I, I got kind of the confirmation of Griffin's got it. He figured it out. And I'm like, yes, I did. And we were going to two inch in those days. And so every piece of clarity we could find, you know, it was very, very important because CDs were out in the, in the early 90s. And two inch, we were struggling to make two inch sound like digital. And well, every piece of openness and every piece of straight wire and every piece of clarity we would really struggle to find. And that was one of the major, major pieces that people who worked on tape got. And that's, yeah. Um, as a singer, I find when I'm, when I'm placing my mic for recording, a lot of times it's just my angle of it, me looking at it, I think that I'm centered. Ooh, really good I'm point. Like super high. Yes. So does that just come with practice? Or is it, it does. Okay. And, and an engineer telling you, OK, it looks a little high. Because what you've got to do, all right, so the singer will set it, or I'll set it. And then what I learned really quick was it, during the first run through, you go back and reset it because they'll either, t like girls, how many of you come in all styling with your heels? And then you get in the vocal booth and realize, I'm going to stand for three hours in here with my heels. And then you put your heels off and it's like, oh, right? <laughs> and so, or guys, you know, how many of you are like, dude, I need a carpet or something? Or, you know, you, know, you start slouching over like, you know, you, you can't do that. And so, yeah, there's always this readjustment that has to happen in the first run through or immediately after it. Don't be afraid. You're like, ah, oh. because if you see somebody like this, you, you just got to know that they aren't going to have the clearest vocal in the whole world. It's kind of like this. Now, there's some debate on whether you should hang the mic upside down or not. I have a very large nose, according to most people, except for me. I look in the mirror and I think it's great. <laughs> but. <laughs> So sometimes the low frequencies tend to build up right around here on a face like mine. So you might want to hang it upside down to kind of let that drain away. And so that's why you see, would see some microphones kind of at an angle underneath to kind of let all this. So if you, if you have a lot of proximity effect, which we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, you might hang the mic upside down. If you have a lot of spit, well, you might not want to use that on your microphone, especially if it's yours and you want to carry it home. Um, so there's all kind of reasons why you would want to hang it upside down, but most of the mics are designed to sit right side up. In ancient days, back in the 50s, you see a lot of them hung upside down. That was so that people could gather around it and all of this apparatus was not in their way. If you have uh, a, a, a chestful person, um, this <laughs> kind of gets in the way, and so you might hang it upside down to kind of deal with that. So, um, that's, yeah. All right, so that's kind of the nuts and bolts about microphone placement. Any questions about that? Was that enlightening to anybody? Okay, okay. Well, we'll do more of this, and if it's you know if, if it starts getting boring, it'll get weird. Uh, okay, uh, pop filter. We don't really have time to talk about pop filters, but use one. Uh, the microphone capsule probably won't collapse with a P and a B, but you'll hear it, and it'll be just this. Nah, who's dealt with P's and B's before? And yeah, it's not fun, is it? So. Now, if you're a singer, how do you deal with purple people? Yay, right? Well, you can actually kind of eat that P. You can go, purple people. Now, it sounds kind of weird, but you can kind of rehearse it a few times. Purple picture, take a picture, right? Instead of take a picture or beautiful booty, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, you can say beautiful, you beautiful bu booty. It's hard to say. Beautiful booty, right? And you can kind of soften your, uh, your plosives. 
So singers, pay attention to your plosives, especially if you're live, because it's like, boom, 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 hey, hey, I mean, that hurts a mic, and so does, all right, is this thing on? That really hurts a capsule. Now, most of these live mics are designed to be used as a hammer anyway, so it's not going to hurt them, but it's not going to be up to spec after you've done that. you got to believe that. So uh, be careful and start singers. Always fudge your P's and your B's and your C's and your K's. Yeah? Do you recommend for singers to bring their own mic for live? Ooh. All right, if they're this kind of mic, no. No, everybody's got this kind of mic or an SM58. If it's this kind of mic that you buy, no. But if you've got like a nice Sennheiser or a nice Neumann, sure. Yeah, I used to carry my own mics until they got stolen. And then I didn't carry them anymore. Uh, but yeah, it was a massive, ma I would plug in my mic and they would be like, oh, we don't have to mix you. And I'm like, that is exactly what you need to be saying about me. Right? And so it, it, well, like, it just kind of takes you up to that next step and it lets everybody know that you mean business as opposed to the next person. And yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I always used to take my, my own, I just left them at a club one night. And what were the brands that you recommended? I, I like Sennheisers. I love the Blue Encore 300. It's amazing. Uh, the Encore 200 is not bad, but they're phantom powered dynamic. So they need power. So they won't just plug in and work on everything, but the, the blue Encore series is really good. Go ahead. Yeah. Some people do, and that's another reason to do that. Sure. Right. Well, what he's saying, I think, that you're saying, let's, well, Imagine me bringing this upside down. So if, if you're moving it out of the way for plosives, well, then your clarity takes a hit, does it not? Right? And so if you put a piece of fabric in front, your clarity takes a hit, does it not? So you get, your clarity is going to take a hit. So it's really on to the singers to reduce those plosives themselves if you want as clear a, a sound as, you know, like a professional. So singers really work on your plosives. That's in almost kind of like 101 singing for uh, for recording, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, would you rather, if I understood your question, would you would you rather place a pop filter to deal with plosives, or would you do like slight mic placement to deal with plosives? A, a pop filter, and the better pop filters do a better job. Like this is kind of a cloth nylon; it'll do a decent enough job. The wire mesh ones now, not not like the Stedmans, but like the blue, the seventy-five dollar blue or the forty-five dollar whatever it is, they do an amazing job. I've got like two of those, and they just do an amazing job without getting rid of a lot of the open high end. Now Sinatra, for instance, was an amazing singer, and he had all this stuff worked out. I mean, he had all the plosives worked out, and before they even went in the studio, they just they had it nailed. So within three or four takes, they were going home because they had to hire musicians and it was an hourly rate and it was all union. And he had people breathing down his neck to get it perfect. So they could literally drop a U47 in front of him with no pop filter or anything and he would just nail it and it would never poke or do whatever. But if you'll go back and you'll listen to the old recording of Etta James with At Last, you can hear some of her plosives right in the middle and it just, with a subwoofer, it just And so that's another example of where it didn't work. So, uh, and some of them, they would angle the mic up, but then you lost the clarity. It's, it's a trade-off. I hope that answered your question. Okay. All right. How close? Well, again, it depends on how your singer is. Um, I, I like six or seven inches to start. Unless there's a good reason, like you know what that reason is to move, stay there. There, there are several reasons for this. Every vocal booth is not made perfectly. Uh, and this kind of gets rid of a lot of those room reflections. Some of you may have that nice uh, SE reflection filter. That's a really cool thing, but you still, I would say, six to seven inches because there's this proximity effect that happens where the low end gets boosted. We'll talk about that right now. Um, well, maybe we won't. How still sit should the singer be? Very, very. You see on MTV all the time, you know, well, Maybe you don't see anything on MTV anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you used to see people be like, oh, oh, babe, oh, you know, or whatever it was. <laughs> and, you know, they're kind of moving around. I can remember when the new engineers at our place uh, first recorded uh, 50 Cent. 
And they were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how still he stays on the microphone. I'm like, yeah, that's why he's selling millions of records. Because that, that vocal is perfect. It is so clear. And they said, I didn't watch him, but they said that he was like this. And he would move his bottom, but he would just <laughs> stay still like this. And he would be just like, and just like, and every singer that I've recorded, John Legend to, Ke to, um, to Kelly, to Janet, to every, every great singer that I've seen just stays f super focused. They don't move. They don't do now, they move a little just so they can kind of get the feel of it, but they are in there in a profession. They are looking for that gold record, and they know all of this stuff that I'm telling you. They know about that clarity. They know about that sweet spot, and they're like, my record will have the most amazing vocal ever, and that's what they're working on. So singers, that's kind of got to be your mindset. My record will sound better than everybody else's, and, and so I hope I'm just kind of shedding some light that it's all kind of about you on that mic. Okay, we're going to move a little. So I hope I've made my point on how far to back up on loud notes. Not much. Not much at all. So if you're in the booth, and like, okay, let me, let me just address this really quick. Um, can I have a volunteer? Would you like to come up and be my volunteer? You've been my volunteer before. And okay, stand up here for me. Okay, how far do you want to project your voice? Like when you're singing. Number one, you're nervous right now, correct? Yeah. All right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how far do you want people to hear? Do you, when you're singing in the mic, what's your, give me like in terms of feet, how far you want to project? Like right now, in this moment. I, you don't want to project. I don't want to like project my voice right now. No. Yeah. Well, what if a high note comes up and you're like, ah! you know, and you kind of crap out as a singer, right? What do we do when we want to go high as singers? Yeah, we breathe in, we take that and go, ah, right? So do you want to do that right here with this thing? I mean, it's as big as your whole freaking face, yeah. <laughs> right? All right, have a seat. So we've got this kind of spider. <laughs> we've got, thank you very much, by the way. Yes. All right, so we've got this spider contraption right here going, uh. Now, let's back up in a live situation. So if you're singing into this mic, how far, who sings live, by the way? All right, who are you singing to? Are you stopping your tone right here when you sing live? No. Or are you going out there? No. All right, this is no different when you sing in a booth. Now, frequently in a booth, you've, you've either got something right behind you and everything's stuck. You have got to imagine 100 people sitting out there and project to them. So instead of going, oh, baby, where I'm projecting to right here, I've got to go, oh, baby, right? all the way out. And if you don't do that, you're going to have a really hard time. So it doesn't really matter at that point how far you back up on your loud notes because your notes are already loud. And so when you go, oh, 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 yeah. It, I mean, you're getting as loud as you need to get to project out there. And this microphone simply is in the way, and you've got to project like that. So it doesn't make any sense for you to go, oh, 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 oh because then the microphone is now placed now, a foot away, where it should have been only six to seven inches, the proximity effect, which is kind of that low note that kind of boils up when you get close, all gets gone away just for one note. And so the low end that you had in your EQ on your mix now just kind of goes weird, and you're just like, oh, what just happened? And so you create lots and lots and lots of problems for your mix engineer to deal with. Yeah? But you're also creating a problem for your tracking engineer at the same time, because let's say you and I agreed on a certain level, and we made that signal-to-noise ratio, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say you sang 75% from you know what you can actually do. Yeah. And then you know halfway through the song, you're giving 100%. Right. I set that mic pre up to your 75%. As soon as you go to the 100, it will overload. Even mm -hmm. though I'm giving it head, gave your uh, signal headroom. Right. Still. You know, maybe your peak is going to zero, and we're on digital board. That means you're clipping. And who's dealt with this? I deal who's with who's it dealt with this? Yeah, but uh, I, I actually on analog here sometimes find that. On analog, I said on analog is mm -hmm. fine, but I'm talking about digital. Who, who's dealt with this as well on, on digital? All right. So what do you do? All right, my. Do you stop? My question is, do you then? Oh, you can stop, never stop. stop. Let's stop the recording, or you just move on and adjust the mic pre. 
and keep moving on? Yeah, see, this is a great, great question that all engineers deal with. Let me, let me say the fault I think is shared. Number one, if you're kind of like, if, you're, if you as a singer are not giving it your all all the way through the session and all of a sudden there's this high note and you like clip the microphone, there's a couple of things at play. Number one, the engineer didn't ask you to sing loud enough to like get where you really were, or the compression's not set well, or all these. I mean, how do you think Christina Aguilera goes in like, oh, and then at the end, oh, right? You know, somebody. I, I would, when I was a young engineer, I would listen to these original recordings of hers back in the '90s, and I would be like, how do they do it? How do they set that stuff? Well. They set it very conservatively to start, and they expect this on a good singer. And they're setting that compressor kind of light, but everything's kind of low, right? You're not peaking your meters at all. You're kind of about halfway up, and you're ready for that, like, ah! And you can kind of know. So I think the fault is shared, because the singer ought to be able to go in, dude, I can kind of see or hear that that's kind of loud. You know I'm going to bust you, right? Like, how many singers know that they've got some power, right? Or so you know you're going to bust them if they set it too conservatively. So you might actually go on and give the engineer some bust up. They'll give them your last note. Yeah, yeah. But at the same note, you're, you mentioned compression. But mm -hmm. I, as an engineer, want a clear, sig clean signal. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that right now because you've got a great point. In fact, this is our next thing we're going to talk about. Okay. Yeah. When you use gear, because you bring up very valid points. You're just ahead of me a little bit. No, no, you're good. You're, you're very, very right on target. Okay, and everybody else has got the same questions. So, it should be like bloody listening to money. Who knows what I mean? Okay, well, when you put on your headphones again and you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe how expensive this sounds. I can't believe how good this sounds. I can't believe just the clarity of the vocals. I can just hear what, I, can, I know why they spent 50 million on this record. Right? It's when you say that to yourselves. It's just, it should just sound like money. And you can do that, but you have to allocate your resources very well. Here's what I recommend. Now, this is, this is me, and this is what I did, and this is what all my friends who actually kind of are here in New York or in Nashville did. We bought the right mic first. We didn't buy anything. We bought the cheapest stuff we could get our hands on, and we bought the right mic first. And what I mean by the right mic is something over $1,600, right? If you've got a Rode NT1A, it's, it's amazing. I put a lot of people on the radio with an NT1A. It, it's really, really good for what it is, but you'll never get the clarity, and you'll never get that open, beautiful top end out of a Rode NT1. Sorry. But for, for anything under, like, $1,000, I think it just rules. Who's got a Rode NT1? Yeah, that, yeah beautiful, right? Who's got like a Perception 200 or one of these or something under 1600 bucks? Shout it out. What you got? See? See? No. <laughs> a 414's not bad, but it's not what I'm talking about. But you'll never get the clarity out of that that you hope for. Uh, it's a very, very good mic. I use them on Tom's and I use them on Airheads and they're beautiful. Um, my favorites right now are the Blue Kiwi, which is a nice $1,700 mic. Um, the Neumann TLM 49 is just blowing my ears away right now for what it does for the money. It's amazing for the money. It's like list $1,699 or something. TLM 49. For the money, I cannot believe how open it is. It's amazing. And I'm definitely getting one. Um, because the grill is so big, nothing builds up and it's just completely open. Um, now, it doesn't look too cool, but it's, it, oh, it's gorgeous. Um, I'm loving a vintage 6000 uh, not a 6000 a $12,000 C12. Not the C12VR, but the original C12s. I'm loving those. But they have to have the right tube in them. If they don't have the right tube, they just sound like any other mic. The Manly's the same way. The Manly Gold Reference, it's, you know, if you don't put the right tube in it, oh, then those tubes make it sound so good. And the cool thing about tube electronics is you can change that tube out to get open or closed depending on what you want. Okay, the right compressor next. Again, save your money on everything else. Now here's where the right compressor comes in. In my opinion, now this is just me, 
But here's my opinion on what the right compressor is. LA-2A, every time. CL-1B, every time. Anything else? You could get away with an LA-3A. You could get away with a 160SL, which is DBX product, some of the upper end. But the LA-2A, fellas, ladies, and if you don't know what that is, it's a nice, brilliant compressor. And what a compressor does is it takes your loudest peaks and it pushes them down. It's like an automatic volume level going eh -eh 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 -eh, according to what you sing. So when you go loud, it's like, Ooh, and when you go soft, it's like, oh, let's go. So it's, it's just kind of bringing everything kind of in this nice place. So the compressor next, and that'll help you. And the that is completely open, completely transparent. There's a reason why those things go for $5,000, because it sounds it. You put that thing on your vocal, and you will have no problems ever again. Um, and, yeah. As a singer, a lot of times they talk about um, how it sounds tight from the compression. Ah. Can you give an example of what that is and what a singer should be looking for so that they know, like, oh, I don't like that sound? Or what I, wish I, a, I wish I had a black one. considered bad. Okay. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So if I've got, I'm singing here, and I'm coming up and I'm singing right here, and then I go, oh, and then I go down here, oh. All right, this level from here to here is called dynamic range, correct? So we have a range. I think you're blocking it. Right? Everybody can see that? Mm -hmm. All right, and so what a compressor does, basically, it'll look at this and it'll go, uh, 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 we don't want you going any higher than this. And so it'll just kind of make that dynamic range smaller and smaller, depending on how you set it. Now you can set it where it doesn't react at all. It just kind of is this nice process that it goes through and it's really useless if you don't set it correctly. But if you set it kind of nicely, it'll just take the little piece off so it won't affect this. It'll get this a little bit and then it won't affect this at all and so on and so forth. What right? does that sound though when it's really tight? Like when it's really tight, it just sounds crunchy it sounds, um, well, in your face, is, it, it, it does have that effect. I'm looking for an eraser, but I don't see one. Um, it sounds unnatural. Anybody else got any help for me on how a too tight compressor sounds? Pushed? Pushed? Yeah, it, it, lifeless. Yeah, it's got all the punch taken out of it. Okay. It's in your face, and it's kind of like here. But it just stays there, and it doesn't move and grab and, and live with you. So um, if you get the right compressor and you set it at a moderate level, oh, it's just butter. So again, LA3A, LA2A, which these are, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, okay. Do you, uh, do you have like a certain gain reduction tempo pattern? Oh, man. Sometimes, like if I'm recording a Christina Aguilera type, like Hannah here, uh, it will go to minus 20, but if you're setting your mic pre-level fairly conservative, it won't distort, and you've kind of caught yourself where otherwise it would have been a clip and you would have had to re-record that take. So, um, but you set it, you kind of get to know your gear, and you kind of get to know what it likes to do, and you figure it out. And so, no, I'm trying to go, you know, maybe up to 5 dB compression when I'm tracking. And then I'll do the rest on mix, because at that point it doesn't matter. I can do as much as I want, and if it's too much, I just back it off. And nobody cares, and nobody will know. And what do you think of compressors and boards? They're not outboard compressors. Let's say need compressors. Oh, they're gorgeous. Like, do yeah. you use them on vocals conservatively? When you no, uh, in just in my opinion, they're solid-state devices, uh -huh. and I would never put a solid-state device on a vocal. It's too fast, and it would grab too much. That's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I might do a DBX compressor, but yeah. mm, and an LA3 is technically solid state, but it's modeled after tube technology, and it has that opto thing, and so you know, you get where I'm going. Yeah. Any questions about compression? I'll be around if you don't get it. Okay. Obviously, we're going to go a little over. Is that okay with everyone? Okay. All right. Now then, here's where your money is. And I say half of the right EQ, and the right EQ, in my opinion, is a Pultec, or a Sontec, or a GML, nothing else. Because again, we're trying to go for this straight wire approach. We're trying to go for this beautiful approach. So you, you know, a GML is like, what, $6,000 now? 
pull tech is minimum $5,500 on the used market. So we're talking real, real money. So if you don't want to do an EQ, you don't have to. And even then, only go about halfway of where you think it should go. You'll get into trouble if you don't. So if you want a little boost on 16K on a pull tech, it's just gorgeous. Back off halfway and you'll be really happy with yourself in the mix. If you want a little suck out of 250 hertz or 100 hertz on the pull tech, you can do kind of the boost and suck trick on the pull tech, which is what I do. And it's just gorgeous. When you pull that fader up on a mix, you don't have to do anything to it except maybe a little low pass or a high pass rather, a little low filter. Yeah. And uh, you're done. The vocal's just done and it's sitting there and it's going to go on the radio just like that. It's, it's brilliant and perfect. All right, next. Let's talk about 80 converters really, really quick because I want to kind of fly through some of this and get to your real discussion. Uh, you notice that I put this last. Why did I put this last? Any, any ideas? We hear all about, yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, but uh, what? Well, maybe, maybe. We're on the front end side, right? Because we've not been converted yet. Now, for singers, does anybody, does, do you singers know what conversion is? All right, there's a process where we store the electrical signals that are generated by the vocal. When I sing into a mic, an electric signal somehow is being generated and going down the cord and getting through all the gear and like doing its thing, and then it has to get stored somehow for later retrieval. We have a, a series of number systems on a computer, and it gets stored into complex twos complement number sets that are just, I mean, like, I don't know, Einstein's like mentor described all this, and it was crazy. And nobody in their right mind knows what they're doing, which is why they're crazy and they eat people. So, <laughs> the, you know, these, these are weird, weird people coming up with these number sets. So I can't understand them and nobody else can. Who, who, who gets it? Yeah, you would. Okay, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's, it's not that complicated once you understand two's complement number sets and logarithmical addition, but who wants to do that? I, I want to work on my, like, high D, right? Or I want to work on getting a better kick drum sound, so I'm not doing that. But uh, I'm glad you exist. Thank you. Um, so what happens is it gets converted into these number sets so we can store it later. And the converter is that little interface that you see kind of connecting your microphone and your computer. And on the computer side, it's converted. On the microphone side, it's not. So that little thing in between. Does that make sense? Okay, so your converter anymore, now 10 years ago, this was not the case. 10 years ago, you wanted the best converter you could buy. And you still kind of want the best things you can buy, right? But the converter is the last thing. And here's why. In the last five years, even in the last three years, all the new converters are using like five bit del delta sigma modulation and the filter settling times are much better. Uh, and it just ends up in a lot less uh, mechanical noise inside the chip. And so your noise floor is way low, and so you can get the dynamic range you want. In other words, it sounds really, really good. Even the worst stuff out now is better than the best stuff out 10 years ago. So you're not going to go wrong with even the cheapest stuff you buy. They're all using nice little AKM chips. They're using analog devices chips, and it's not so terrible, right? Clocking technology has gotten really good. We're oversampling at 6.8 megahertz or something like that. I don't know what the pure math is on 128 overtimes oversampling, but really, really fast. And we're talking like AM radio range of how fast this stuff is moving. I mean, it's just, it's getting every signal we can throw at it. There is no fault with your converter. These things will make so, so, so much more difference than your converter will. If your converter doesn't suck, well, the first thing it's going to show up is that your mic does, right? And if your mic doesn't suck, the first thing a great converter is going to show up is your compressor now sucks. So it's better to do this. And what our thing was in my generation was, OK, you buy the good converter. I'll buy the L LA-2A. You buy the Manly. And we'll just all go on all the sessions together. And it worked. So when they call you, you call me. And that's kind of how it worked. So, okay, I play bass, Chris plays saxophone and keys, he's got the la 2 e he's got the Wadia converter, okay, Will's got the drums, dude's got the mic, okay, we'll just be the band and we'll produce this together. And all of us are still here. So, <laughs> it worked. See how that, and so don't buy, buy it in stages, because what you'll do is you'll be like, okay, I'm buying the mic, because I'm a singer, I'm buying the great mic. 
you're my engineer, you buy the compressor, and we'll just work together. And so I'll bring the mic over. And you'll be like, dude, yeah, can I borrow your mic? Can I borrow your compressor? Yes. <laughs> and then now they're married. So. <laughs> Singers, do you agree with this? The best way to make somebody feel safe is to make it sound awesome yeah. when they get on the headphones. Singers, raise your hand if this is right. What if it sounds terrible when you go in and put it on? What do you think? Hannah? Yeah. Now, but do you think it about the sound or do you think it about the engineer? The engineer and myself. Yeah. And, and so what happens to your vibe as a singer when any suckage comes into the room? All right. So right there, his mechanics have now overridden art. Am I correct? In that so the proper application of mechanics has actually, or the improper, has actually negated our art. So you see where I'm going on this mechanical thing first? All right, let's, let's kind of start talking about art a little bit. You basically want it to sound like you recorded here. And this is the, Be uh, the, yeah, the Beach Boys with a vintage U47 and a vintage Brauner hung down, not here. <laughs> right? I was so excited when I found these. This was I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. How many of you actually recorded in a place like this? Or yeah, did you feel really great about yourself when you came out of that session? How many of the engineers have done this? I've I've done this. Yeah. Yeah. We used a couch. Yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, uh, we all kind of started here. I think all of the singers have started here, too. Yeah, you don't really feel that great about yourself when you come out of one of these. So, so, so you want to go back to this. This is what we want to sound like. So if you have this, but you've got like a $12,000 Elam 251 setting up there, now things are a little different. OK, I know where to spend my money. You know, and you've got like beanie weenies on the stove because you can't afford anything else and no girlfriend. So, so. why can't we ever go out to eat? Because I bought a mic. <laughs> How much time to devote a lead vocal? Any ideas? Not more than 45 minutes. Ooh, OK. That's even too much. That's interesting. Depends, depends on the singer. I mean, well, let's know, just let's, let's, let's say somebody, you know, I've, I've done John Legend a lot. Uh, for a nice commercial radio ready lead vocal, how much, imagine. How much, singers, how much time do you want? <laughs> Wait, wait, say it again. Three hours, Three hours is good. All right. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I could give you 13 hours, but I doubt you do. Ed, do you have a, an hour and a half? OK. All right, here, here is what I found. It's kind of that magic bullet. Um, I found that uh, for kids under 14, and I do a lot of kids, for kids under 14, two hours max, they'll start crying. They really will. And two hours is about right. You know, that first hour, they're kind of excited, and you're not really getting any good stuff. You're getting a few pieces. Uh, but that second hour, they're really starting to work. The third hour, they literally, it's like, ding, 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 I mean, it's like a freaking alarm clock with some of these kids, especially like 10 and 11-year-olds. And they're in past their bedtime, and it's like, oh, man. Yeah, it's, that'll happen once. For adults, four to five. <laughs> They'll start crying. <laughs> and it's, it's almost like a clock. Yeah. How many of you have been in the booth as a singer? What happens on about that fourth hour? You just, you're just getting exhausted. Out. You mentally can't focus on pitch anymore. Yeah. 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 Now, some of you do get tired after about 45 minutes, and I get that. Uh, and, it, and it does kind of depend on the singer, but as a good producer, you guys that are producers ought to be able to kind of work that out, give them breaks. And we'll go through exactly how to do this. You must budget your time. You must. Your resources are very, very limited. Now, four hours might seem like a gold mine worth of time to you guys who are like 45 minutes and I'm done, an hour and a half and I'm done. This might seem like a gold mine, but when we get to the other page of how I go through a vocal to get it on the radio, uh, you'll see kind of where I'm going with this. All right, so let's talk about that. How do you manage your time? I suggest working on the hard parts first. OK, work them out beforehand. Singers, you know going in what the hard parts are going to be. You know where your pitch is not working out. 
How many of you know how to work out your pitch? Some of you Pop Vocal Academy students definitely know how to work out your pitch because we've talked about it. Phrase by phrase, really slow. So let it go. You know, you got to really work it out, really work it out. Um, you cannot fly through this. You got to work out every pitch so it's perfect. Um, producers, singers, you will not get every phrase perfect. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're like Celine Dion or Self, like come back from like the 50s back to the 20s. You will not get every phrase perfect. It is just impossible. Perfection does not exist. Now you can work it out and over a few days you'll get most phrases, but there will be that one phrase that you forgot every time. Deal with it, just, just chill about it. It's gonna be okay. Nobody else will notice anyway. So, but you'll not get it perfect, so don't try. You'll wear out everybody in the room trying. No, min no more than three minutes on each phrase with a kid. If you, if you work a kid and you'll be like, okay, no, that's not it, and, and three minutes have passed, you are done. Move on, you might get it again, but if you get that one phrase, you can be assured that you won't get any others. Adults are double, six minutes. How, how many of you singers have been in a room, uh, in the booth, and the producer is just working and working and working and working and working, and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't give him anything else. Hannah, right? What about the subsequent phrases? Where are they now? They're not there. You've been vibed out. Does that make sense? So as a producer, you cannot, you, you gotta let some things go. Choose your battles very wisely. Let them at least get through the whole song a, a couple of times before you start in. That's just not fair, and we'll talk about that too. Okay, never vibe a singer. You do it once in your career, and then that's it. Once you've got a singer in the bathroom, and you're like, oh, I gotta go in there and like comfort them and bring them out, and I hate them. That is the most unhappy vocal session, and you know you still gotta get a vocal after you've all berated them and made them feel funny. Who's been in this position? You have? Mm. Wasn't fun. No. You'll do it once in your career, and then you'll never, ever do it again. How are we on time? Are we good? Okay. Let's talk about vibe for just a second. What about candles and darkness? Who has an opinion on candles and dimming the studio and making it all like groovy? And it drives me crazy. Does it drive you crazy? For most of us technical types, it drives you because we can't see. <laughs> what you got? Singers, what do you like? What, what do you like? You like dark? Most singers do. Who likes dark? Raise your hand. All right, who likes light and just like it doesn't matter? Yeah. Okay, you, you guys that say it doesn't matter, you are lying. You are lying. Yeah. And it's up to you as a singer either to tell your boys or, or young ladies that are working with you. It's up to you producers to figure out if they're not telling you what the deal is. So here's what I recommend. Hang on just a second. Um, put the candles, number one, where the singer can see them. It does you absolutely no good if you can see the candles, but they can't. That's not the point. We don't care about you. We do care about you, but we don't, not in this case. So here's a, here's a tip. Get your levels, get the singer relaxed, light a candle or two and see what happens. In my experience, nine times out of 10, the singer's like, oh, how nice, right? That's my experience. You try it and see if I'm right. You know, I don't care. You're gonna leave here and I'm never gonna see you light candles ever again. So, but try it and see if I'm right. Um, <clears throat> have fresh water in the booth. Now, most singers will bring their own water. But what happens after about the third take? Yeah, you're out. And most of you are like either fed up with your engineer or so scared of him and your producer that you're like, I'm not asking that dude for anything, <laughs> right? And so most of you engineers and producers don't want, you know, you don't intend that, but it's just kind of what, how many, how many singers are like completely at ease and 100% relaxed when they go into a new studio with new people? Yeah, uh-uh. Yeah, you're, you're scared of everything. 
And so have, go on and have, if you want your singing to be relaxed and trust you, even though they're completely nervous, just go on and have like two or three extra bottles of water in the booth so that they don't even have to ask you because they won't. How many of you singers will actually go out of, excuse me, I need some more water. Like, well, okay, you're a badass. I like you. Yeah. 